Okay, sounds great. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about Alice of the Bitterroot. Um, you know, there's a ton of info we could cover. There's a, we have so many awesome owls here. We don't have that much time. So um, just know, oops, let's see here. No, it's not letting me, there we go. Don't wanna jump ahead too much. Um, I do work on the MPG Ranch, uh, which is in Florence for those of you who are not familiar with it or from even Montana. Um, here's Missoula to the north. Florence is just south of that. We're about 17,000 acres of a conservation property. The former Schrader Brothers Cattle Ranch, if you know the Schraders. And um, I've been there since 2010, uh, working on birds and other things. And here's me releasing a long-eared owl as part of my research. But just so know that most of the pictures and things I'll be sharing with you today are from um, the research, a lot of the research that I do there. We have permits from both the state and federal government to be doing this research and handling birds. So you just can't go banned and, and do things with or to birds without approval. So, um, but that's one of the reasons I'm so lucky to have some great photos and things to share with you is because we do have research permits and we do capture and track a lot of these birds in different ways. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about owls in Montana and focus on the bitterroot. I wanna focus on three species since we don't have a ton of, of time, we don't have all day. And I think these are really great examples of some different life history and special things, special owls. And they're all pretty small and they all are relatively common. And um, we'll talk a little bit about just owl diversity and hopefully you'll be really impressed by that. Give you some tips for identification, where you might find them, some of their natural history. And then I'm gonna end with uh, just a few suggestions if you're into owls um, for what you can do, how you can learn more, and how you could make maybe your property or some of your actions owl friendly. Okay, so some of you might know this, but we have five or 15 species of owls in Montana. And uh, I grouped the ones that are in the bitterroot as pretty widespread and common. Things like this great horned owl is probably the one most people are familiar with. And here, I'm just gonna play the hoot. They're really active right now. It's the peak of their breeding season. Okay, so we have a pair duetting there with the male being lower and the female higher. If you have pets at home, they might be on the alert right now. Um, the other really widespread ones we have are the sawwet owl and the northern pygmy owl. And then I listed these, another list of kind of um, restricted in that they have fairly specialized habitats or places they like to live and or maybe they migrate. So something like the boreal owl is pretty common in parts of the Bitterroot, but only at high elevations. So Lost Trail Pass is a place um, that they, they are common or some of the higher um, peaks on the west side. Um, and similarly, Great Grays also like that higher elevation. Um, we don't really know much. We know there have been a handful of uh, breeding burrowing owls in the Bitterroot in recent years. Also, people tell tales of barn owls, um, but we just really don't know much about their populations here. So if people have any info or have ever seen them, um, that would be great information to share and we can sure um, keep track of that without disclosing uh, private info from people. Let's see, just get one more person coming in here. Infrequent northern hawk owls are more of a boreal species, more common up in glacier, but they do pass through snowy owls occasionally. And then the eastern screech owl is one that occurs in Montana, but way east of the continental divide, so not for us here. And just in terms of diversity, you know, we, we think of a lot of owls being uh, associated with forests and trees, uh, but we do have species like this one is a short-eared owl and it's an owl of open country. So it likes um, kind of open grassland, sometimes marshes, and they actually nest on the ground. They make this little kind of scrape and that's a short-eared owl nest that we found on MPG Ranch a few years ago. Then we also have things like these long-eared owls that are uh, a bit more forested, but sometimes they like dense shrubs, shrub rows, um, shrubby draws, um, or things like here's a nest um, I found in a uh, mistletoe clump. So really hard to see. You could imagine how you might walk through the woods and never see this. 
And there's the owl kind of sitting with its long, these aren't really ears, but it has these feathers that act like uh, great camouflage, like they're mimicking twigs. And most of these owls do eat small mammals. And so um, this is a movie that we happen to get um, from one of our game cameras on the ranch. Um, and I will warn you, here's a vole here on this side. This vole will not survive or the, the length of this movie, um, but you'll get a, a, get a sense of how um, owls can hunt. So they have incredible hearing. And this is actually, this is a very kind of unusual movie to get. This is a long-eared owl. So again, you can see these little ear tufts on here, feather tufts. Um, they are typically nocturnal as are most owls, but this one happened to be out during the day. And just really beautiful, beautiful owl. Um, like I said, they eat mostly small mammals. One way to study them is by dissecting their pellets. And these were pellets from a long-eared owl. And you can see these are all mostly vole skulls. We have a couple different vole species here, probably some mice too. Um, and then we have documented, I have another study uh, on scavengers. Uh, it's interesting, great horned owls come to uh, carcasses and dead, dead stuff quite often. So they can scavenge in addition to hunting. Uh, most owls kind of regurgitate uh, what we call an owl pellet. So this is just a really condensed mat of all the fur and bones and ba basically undigestible parts. And um, you can see the variation in size. This is a sawwed owl and a long-eared owl and a great horned owl. So you can kind of tell who's hanging out if you find owl pellets based on the size of the pellet you see. And that's actually a really great way to find them, particularly in winter. A lot of the owls that are here in the winter will use the same roost um, routinely. And you'll see just piles and piles of pellets under it. This is a, from a long-eared owl roost. And then the other thing you'll see in addition to the pellets like this uh, is what we call whitewash. This is where they actually do poop and it's a, really thick and kind of chalky and almost yellow um, dropping and much thicker than what you might see for most, uh, most birds. Now I'm just gonna get into talking about um, some of our star species. This one is um, really a really cool and unusual owl. It's called the flammulated owl. I'm guessing most of you have never seen one of these even though they are quite abundant in certain forests here in the Bitterroot. And um, here's, I'm gonna play their hoot for you, which is also quite soft and can be really hard um, to hear. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, it's much different than the great horned owl hoot. Um, you can see from this map, um, they have a really tiny range uh, in North America and in Montana. And the orange on this map is their breeding area. So even here, Western Montana is on it. But notice they are a migratory owl. They migrate a huge distance south, we think, to Southern Mexico and into, into Central America. That's really unusual for the owls here. And uh, one of the reasons they do that is because their diet is almost exclusively insects. And um, in, within insects, it's almost all moths. Um, they nest in a cavity. They just lay two to three eggs um, and they are pretty tiny, about seven inches and uh, tall and they weigh between 45 and 60 grams. So that's even smaller than a robin. So think of something for you East, Eastern people, maybe like a cardinal uh, or catbird or solitaire for us in the West. Um, and you can see their global population is just over, we think just over 5,000 individuals. So pretty small population. It's a species of concern here in Montana and uh, partially because we just don't know that much about them. And the fact that they eat insects um, is a bit concerning because uh, we are seeing across all birds that eat bugs, uh, pretty major declines. And you can see, sorry, over here, they're pretty limited to Western Montana. 
just so you can get a sense of how tiny they are. I put some of these handling pictures in here for the different owls, just so you could maybe put them to scale with a person's hand. And uh, this is Mary who works with me and I guess she's pretty small too. So just know this is a tiny, tiny owl. And here's, uh, you can see these were ones that had to go into rehab. Their nest was pulled apart by a bear. Uh, but again, that's a person's palm. Um, pretty small owls when they're born. Um, you get a pretty good sense, I think, from all of these pictures. One of the other really unique uh, features of flammulated owls is that they have a dark eye. So there's only a handful of other owls in Montana that have a dark eye and they're all, they're both big. And that's the barn owl and the barred owl. So if you see a small owl in the woods and it has dark eyes, it's a flammulated. Um, you can kind of see in these pictures too, they get their name flammulated means flame or red and they often have um, different amounts of red in their plumage. This picture really shows, um, even for the other small owls we'll talk about, how big their wings are um, compared or in proportion to their body size. So even though they don't weigh much, they have a huge wingspan. And for these guys, what it helps them do, they're actually um, kind of like fly catching species. They sit in the dark in the woods and uh, they are watching for their main food item which are all the moths that are out at night. And a lot of these moth species might be ones you, um, if you're into forestry or into forests, you might consider forest pests. So in a way, the flammulated owls are helping us uh, regulate um, insect populations in the woods. Here's just some pictures of habitat. Um, so think about um, dry, open uh, conifer forests for us in the Bitterroot, uh, probably more likely on the east side of the valley. I'm not sure that they'd be on the west side. And think about forests, uh, ponderosa pine or dry ponderosa pine and Douglas fir that have arrowleaf balsam root in the understory. That's a great kind of side cue um, for great flammulated owl habitat. Um, this is a, a kind of a, a territory of one um, that we were tracking. This is kind of up Miller Creek um, for people that are at the north end of the valley. Think about like the Dean Stone area and upper Miller Creek. There is some larch and kind of more wet forest up there, but you can kind of see there's some balsam root even right here. Um, you can see or maybe not see in this picture why they're so hard um, to find if you don't know where they are or you're not lucky to have a radio transmitter on one. There's actually a pair of them right here in the outer branches of this uh, ponderosa. But in addition to sitting in places like that, um, here's a close up of them. They also can sit close uh, to the tree trunk. But remember, if they're 50 to 80 feet up and smaller than a pine cone, you're going to have a really hard time seeing them. So um, just know that they're out there. And as you're hiking in the spring and enjoying things like arrowleaf balsam root, um, the flammulated owls should be coming back to those areas. I think they arrive back, I'm trying to remember, in April. And they might stick around through September, but they're gone the rest of the year. So right now, they're enjoying Mexico, hopefully. And uh, we have a couple of projects in the works in the next year or two to help us track um, where they go um, after they breed here in Montana. This is one, I'm glad a couple of you said this is the one you wanted to know about, the little northern pygmy owl, super tiny. And uh, I think of the owls I'll talk about today, this is the one all of you have the best chance of maybe encountering here in the winter. And here's its hoot. So be listening for this when you're out in the woods. Okay, it's pretty distinct uh, little hoot and they can actually be quite loud. Um, you can see from this range map, they have a little bit of a bigger range than uh, the flammulated owl did. And they tend to be year round residents wherever they occur. Um, but um, like I was telling some folks earlier while we were hanging out, um, winter's a great time to see them because even if they breed are up high um, in the summer, they come down to low elevations a bunch in the winter. And um, so they're just more visible and there are more of them. 
Um, compared to some of the other owls you might be familiar with, um, they are both diurnal, which means they're out during the day quite a bit. And they also are eating mostly small birds. And that's part of why they're out during the day. So uh, if you're something like a nuthatch or a chickadee, uh, you're really not interested or wanting to be around pygmy owls. Um, they are capable of a little more uh, productivity than the flammulated owls. They can have up to seven eggs in their nest, also a cavity nester, and they weigh just a little bit more uh, than the flammulated owls, so they're more in the size of a, a robin. Um, again, they are year-round residents, and they think the global population is about 80,000. But like the flammulated owls, you can see this map, you can, the darker colors are kind of higher density of observations and look how many there are in the Bitterroot. Um, they are west of the divide for us for the most part. And here, just to get a sense of how tiny the pygmy owl is, you can see uh, it has yellow eyes, lots of spotting all over its face and body and barring in the tail. And this is the territory of one pygmy owl that we were tracking kind of mid to upper elevation. It's just under 6,000 feet, um, but mixed conifer forest. Uh, I think they could be in any forest type here in the Bitterroot, probably more likely to be at mid to upper elevation for breeding than down on a floodplain. Um, but they certainly could be lower now in the winter. Also can be pretty hard to to find uh, if they're roosting like this male is here in a Douglas fir. These are about the size of a ponderosa pine cone. But again, the one of the great things about them is they're active during the day and if they're tooting is what we call it when they're doing their little hoot. Um, they are often at the top of a pretty um, visible or obvious tree. They like snags to toot from and uh, here's kind of what they look like. He's got his throat kind of open and is, is hooting there. And so that makes them kind of easy to, relatively easy to find. The other, their magic trick is that you can see this is the front of a pygmy owl. Um, and then this is the back of a pygmy owl. They actually have these little eye spots or fake eye spots on the back of their head, which people think are uh, one strategy they have um, to confuse songbirds and other things that they're trying to hunt. And here's just another view of that. Um, so one way you can find pygmy owls and sometimes the other small owls too, is to listen for agitated chickadees and nuthatches. If you're taking a walk and you hear and see a big flock of birds all chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee and bouncing around, um, you might just take a few minutes and try to scan and see there could very well be an owl. Um, that they're mobbing. Uh, we were lucky enough to observe a pair of pygmy owls um, kind of all through their courtship in one spring. So this is the male and female. And they, like I said, are cavity nesters and uh, they were using a tree, uh, a larch that was partially dead, mostly dead, a little bit alive, but you can see that tree in the center has a lot of holes. These guys all rely on some other bird, like a flicker, some other woodpecker to make the hole for them. And uh, here's the owl kind of just checking out its own potential nest. And then they settled on their nest. Uh, these, these guys uh, breed a little bit later than our other owls. They're starting in mid-April, whereas most of the other owls are breeding now or in the next couple of weeks. And here's a movie of, a, uh, of the female pygmy owl. You can see they, they used a hole, which they pretty much fill. She can fill it with her whole body, but it does make it a little bit hard for her to get in and out. This video will show. So you can see from that, it's a benefit to them to be able to fill that whole space so that predators, maybe something like a weasel or a squirrel can't get in there, but it certainly can make it harder to, to do what you need to do. And then this is a baby. Uh, this particular nest, I think, ended up having four or five babies. And so, you know, their world is pretty limited. You think about what it's like to be with your siblings in a dark, uh, kind of damp, 
place uh, for weeks at a time. It must have been really nice for them to get out. Um, they fledged in mid-June, so they are a little bit later for their breeding. Okay, then we're gonna turn to the Sawet. This is often people's favorite tiny owl, partially I think because they're fairly common and most people have potentially seen them or heard them. The most common sound you'll hear is their kind of breeding hoot. And so I'll play that for you. Sounds an awful lot like a truck backing up. Um, so if you hear that in the woods, it could be a Sawet owl. Um, they actually get their name from the sound, a uh, one sound they make. It's usually the males that make the sound and when they're agitated. And it sounds like someone wetting or sharpening a saw. And you can imagine that's a pretty haunting noise to come across when you're out in the woods. Um, but just know that it's not an alien. It could be a sawed owl and you could be fairly close to a territory. Um, you can see from this map, super widespread owl. They're all across North America. Um, they breed East Coast to West Coast, all the way up into Alaska. Um, they are considered both migratory and residential here in Montana. And what that means is that there's sawets here all year round. We don't know entirely if any of our birds that breed here stay here, but we surely have birds from the north coming south and either overwintering or passing through. Um, so you can see them any time of year. Um, they feed mostly on small mammals, but uh, they're pretty a, much a generalist. They'll also eat birds, insects, reptiles, amphibians. Um, they nest in a cavity. They have four to seven eggs. And they're a little bit beefier than the other two owls. They're just a little bit taller and they can weigh up to 150 grams. And so uh, kind of like the plumpest robin uh, you could imagine and uh, maybe think of a flicker. Uh, they're pretty dense and powerful. Um, global population, 2 million. So um, this is not a species of concern, um, but it is a great species to study or work with because they are relatively abundant and relatively easy to find. And we can learn some things about other owls that are less common by studying a common one. And you can see on this map in Montana that they do occur west of the divide or east of the divide, but again, they're much more observed on the western side and the bitter root again looks like a, a great hot spot for them. One of the things that's helpful to see with these guys, if you would see a small owl, they have these really beautiful and big and obvious sweet yellow eyes, um, but both as adults and as babies, they have a, a nice white V kind of between their eyes. And so this one in hand is an adult. You can see the baby is down to the left also. The V is even more obvious. Um, they are really beautiful chocolate brown color uh, when, when they fledge and in, you know until they get their adult plumage. And this maybe I'll just show you a bit of footage from some of our game cameras of owls at different times of year and you'll get a chance to see the difference between um, the juveniles and the adults. So owls, like many raptors, do come to water sources either to bathe or drink. And you'll see this one here is probably sharpening its bill on this um, stick that it's near. You have a really prominent facial disc. You can kind of see that. Okay, and this is a group of recently fledged saw wet owls. They're much darker. You see they're not very skilled in flight. And you can see they're trying to figure out um, they're listening, they're great listeners. They have asymmetrical ears so that one ear is high on one side and low on the other, and that helps them triangulate sound at night. This is part of them learning to, to listen. Very clumsy.
<laughs> you can see just a bit of crash landing going on. They are in almost any forest type uh, you can imagine in Montana, at least on the west west of the divide. So if you've got trees, um, they're in it. And similarly in the east, I think they're in almost any forest type out there. Again, what they're limited by in the breeding season is they need a cavity. So they need a dead tree or a tree with a hole in it. Um, we've studied them a lot during migration, and uh, a lot of the times they're using the Ponderosa pine forest down on the floodplain. Um, but you like uh, some of the other pictures I showed of the other owls, they can be really hard to find if they're 90 feet up in the tree. So this one had a radio transmitter, which is why we would we could find it, but we would never have known it was there. They similarly look very much like a ponderosa pine cone and uh, they might be kind of exposed from the top if you could get up to eye level with them, but oftentimes from the bottom, they are not really visible. Um, if they're lower down, they're often using really dense cover. So this was an owl roost. And here's the little owl sitting in there. Um, think about if you're on the floodplain or hiking, kind of thickets with clematis, um, just these kind of cascades of vegetation. And oftentimes the owl will be tucked in there behind. One of the unique things about them, like I said, how abundant they are, um, is that there are huge migrations in certain years, uh, what we call an eruption. Every three to five years in different places where literally hundreds and thousands of uh, saw wet owls are migrating from northern places south and um, there are banding stations like in Minnesota that can get over a thousand in a season. We had one season here, I think it was 2012, where the Owl Research Institute banded over 500 um, just at the north end of the Bitterroot. And um, we were doing a project this fall where I banded 50 in just a handful of days. So this past year was really, they were really abundant too. Um, their migration tends to peak that last week in September and into the first week of October. So it's just a really nice thought to me to think about when you're sleeping at night in the fall that there could be hundreds of these little owls just kind of flying flying through the Bitter Valley. Um, here's one of their magic tricks. Uh, when we have them in hand, uh, they have a, a porphyrins, a, a pigment in their feathers that fades over time. And if you shine a UV light on them, you can actually see if all the feathers are the same age or not. And that helps us age these birds. They molt their flight feathers in kind of little different blocks. And so if we see like the bird on the left, they're all kind of reflecting the same color pink back at us. Um, it has uh, feathers that are all the same age. That is a bird, what we would call a hatch year bird. It was born this year. Uh, the bird on the right, you can see some different blocks. There's really dark pink out here, medium pink in here, and you know, no, no pink there. So that's at least three generations of feathers. So that bird is at least two years old and maybe more. Um, just so you can get a sense of how abundant they could be in the Bitterroot. Um, these two maps that I'm gonna show you are fall data from two different falls where we tracked birds with radio transmitters and tried to track them as they flew south and as they were roosting in places in the valley. And uh, we were banding them up here at the top. So that's why there's that huge cluster there. Um, but you can see little, little dots of owls all over the place. Um, in fact, most of the owls in this study moved out of the valley before migrating south. So they went on a more of a southwest or southeast um, trajectory, which was a big surprise to us. We thought they would fly down the kind of lower elevation along the Bitterroot River. And then if you zoom in even more, this is the MPG Ranch over here. We were banding right in here. This is all state land. It's kind of like what you see when you drive from Lolo to Florence across from Trader Brothers. But again, this is just a couple weeks and over two years. And just think about, these are only the owls we captured. Um, and think about how many owls might have been out there roosting in all of the um, pine, mostly pine trees. And in fact, we did see a couple times two or three owls in the same tree with the owl we were tracking. Um, so to me, that's just kind of magical uh, to think there's that many out there. 
Um, here's what those little owls can be capable of in terms of a flight. This is the 60 mile journey of one of our owls. Again, most of our owls left the valley before um, we tracked them this far. So this is an unusual path, or it was unusual for us to track one this, this distant. Um, but it flew um, in three different nights, 11 miles, 22 miles, and 26 miles. And we ended our last detection was up uh, Pickett Creek out the West Fork, if you know where that is. Um, but it did do a five-day stopover outside of Hamilton. I think this was on the Mildenberger's property. And um, it was there so long, we thought maybe it had actually pulled its transmitter off. Um, and then suddenly one day it wasn't here and we picked it up much farther south. So just know that's a, that's a long way for a bird that isn't really well adapted to strong flight to go uh, 26 miles is a, is a pretty big distance. And we're gonna learn more. Uh, we have a new project uh, with some little tags called nano tags. We should learn uh, a bit more about where they're overwintering and where they're traveling to. Hopefully in the next year or so, we deployed 50 of those tags this fall during migration. The only one that's gotten picked up so far by a receiving station was kind of over by Boise. Okay, and just quickly, just some things you can do or just some things to think about when you're thinking about owls um, and how they relate maybe to your life. Really big for me and I think for lots of wildlife advocates is saving snags on the landscape. Um, these things are incredibly great habitat, not just for owls, but lots and lots of different species, everything from you know woodpeckers and nuthatches to bats. Um, but almost all the owls in Montana, with a few exceptions, use dead trees or dying trees uh, to, to, to nest in. Everything from those little owls we talked about to here's some great horned owls. This is a nice uh, hole in a cottonwood on the floodplain. And um, they're just really great things. So I always kind of cringe when I hear people talk about cleaning up their property, because I know it means they're usually cutting down snags and clearing out underbrush and all of those things are uh, actually really, really good things for uh, wildlife, whether it's the owls or the, the rodents and things they eat. Um, but just know if you can do one thing for owls or wildlife, keeping the snags up there, as long as they're not a danger to you is a really good, um, good thing to do. Um, keeping those cats inside, it's not a secret for most people that know or love birds, but uh, cats kill, I think their estimate is over 4 billion birds a year, and it's one really easy thing everyone can do um, that's better for bird populations, and in terms of small owls coming into rehab, um, cats are the number one or number two behind window collisions in terms of injuries uh, that require rehab. And a lot of times those owls just don't fare well. They're small. Cats can do a lot of damage pretty quickly. So um, catios can be a great option. Um, bird be safe collars or something like this on this cat, my cat, um, are a great visual deterrent for birds that are active during the day. They wouldn't be so helpful with owls at night. But just know there's some options out there and that keeping your cat inside um, is good for owls and can be good for your cat. Um, like I said, glass collisions is like the number one reason small owls come into rehab and lots of birds come into rehab. So um, there are a lot of uh, ways to mitigate that. American Bird Conservancy has a great uh, page and pamphlet on how to break up uh, the reflection on your windows, particularly if you're feeding birds. This, um, that really can create a hazard both for the songbirds coming to your feeder and then the things like pygmy owls or maybe a sharp-shinned hawk that are hunting those birds. Um, just know if you're feeding, please do your best to kind of feed responsibly. And I'll provide a link um, to some of this information. We'll do a follow-up email after this talk, just so you can uh, check out some of these methods. Most of them are pretty inexpensive and shouldn't disrupt your visibility. Um, don't use rodenticides or insecticides. You know, any kind of toxic chemical can just kind of work its way up the food chain. Uh, most of the owls are hunting actively live prey, but they do and can scavenge. And um, particularly for the larger owls, rodenticide can be a problem. Um, you know, and then, like I said, with the flammulated owls are an insect specialist. So um, anything that decreases insect populations can be a bit of a challenge for them. 
And then just this resource, if you find something injured and need to get help, I know Susan has done this with the wax wing recently, and I help out all the time tra transporting injured owls and other hawks. Know that Wild Skies Raptor Center up in Potomac is our local rehabber. Judy Hoy is no longer actively doing that. So this is who we call and we have a network of volunteers that helps to get um, birds up to rehab. And if they make it, um, they get released pretty much uh, close to where they were picked up or if, if need be a more safe location. Just one more resource if you want to learn a bit more. Our state um, heritage program has a really nice field guide. You can use it for anything, um, anything any live creature in Montana. Um, but in particular, it's a great resource for owls and um, it shows you the maps and their natural history and how to ID them. So the Montana field guide is a good online resource. And then if you're interested in our research or any of the other things that I work on, um, on social media, you can follow MPG Wildlife. Um, we have a website. And then um, I also help manage Bitter Audubon and a Montana Scavengers Facebook page. So they're all great places uh, to learn more, kind of get, see how you can get involved. So I'd just like to give a thanks to Stevensville Garden Club for this invite. Um, we'll be following up with everyone just with a thank you email, but just know this club is doing a lot to um, uh, promote community and beautify parts of Stevensville. And if you appreciated this today, uh, this talk today, um, a donation to them to help with some of their projects in, in Stevensville would be really appreciated. And with that, um, I'm going to take questions and maybe uh, people can feel free, the Zoom folks, to turn your cameras on. And again, if you have questions, maybe try to put them in the chat. But we'll start with Susan and anyone um, in person first and see uh, if you guys have questions. I'm 